Good afternoon. We start the session with portfolio questions. Question number one, Mary Evans. To ask the Scottish Government how its reform of school governance will contribute to closing the attainment gap between pupils from the poorest and wealthiest backgrounds. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the defining mission of this government is to close the attainment gap. We believe decisions about children's learning and school life should be decided at school level. We want to empower teachers, parents, children and communities to drive important improvement in education and we will oversee the biggest devolution of powers to our schools. It is right that we consider the role that every part of our education system plays to support the crucial interaction between teacher and child and question whether how we are currently organised supports educational improvement. We know that it is the quality of teaching and excellent school leadership that will close the gap in attainment. Mary Evans. Thank you. Can the Cabinet ex Secretary explain how the removal of the unit assessments at National 5 and higher level were, will further contribute to the work uh, in terms of closing the attainment gap and then further account for how the reduction of these internal assessments will be quality assured to ensure that teachers continue to monitor and track pupil progress appro appropriately? Cabinet Secretary. President officer, I've listened very carefully to the uh, arguments and points around the, uh, the presence of unit assessments, which are, of course, uh, uh, applied to the new qualifications by agreement across the education system. Uh, the changes that I've announced um, to National 5 and higher, which I will be putting to the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board tomorrow, are part of a package of measures designed to address unnecessary bureaucracy and, crucially, to liberate teachers to concentrate on teaching and to change the balance between assessment and learning within the education system so that more time is allocated to being able to concentrate on the learning experience. Um, the uh, whole issue of um, quality assessment is intrinsic to the uh, undertaking of uh, an exercising of teacher judgment within our education system, which is the crucial part of curriculum for excellence. And it is important that that principle is, put, uh, is made central uh, to the delivery of education within Scotland's schools. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary's uh, reform of school governance suggests a new funding formula uh, for schools. What guarantee uh, can he give us that no school will see a real terms reduction in their budget as a result? Cabinet Secretary. Um, the purpose of the, uh, the funding formula is to ensure that we see um, an effective uh, deployment of resources where resources are required to support attainment within our schools. And I would have thought that's a principle the Labour Party would have supported, uh, given what they have said to Parliament before about the importance of ensuring that there is adequate and effective support to ensure that we close the attainment gap within Scotland's education. Uh, the Government, of course, has put proposals to Parliament, which are currently under consideration um, by Parliament, um, for the, uh, the increase of resources to be available to education through the rebanding of the council tax. And I hope the Labour Party are able to support us in that, uh, that measure to ensure that we can ensure new resources are able to be allocated to Scottish education, which is what I thought the Labour Party believed in. Tavis Scott. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. This morning at the uh, Parliament's Education Committee, the Royal Society of Edinburgh suggested that separating the inspectorate from the policy advice that uh, is given by Education Scotland would be an important reform uh, to further Education Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, well, Mr Scott has raised that issue before, and um, I'm interested in what the Royal Society of Edinburgh has said at committee this morning. Uh, the governance review, as Mr Scott will know, um, puts, um, sets out the issues that have got to be considered about the range of national bodies that have an involvement in the improvement of education because, in my view, um, the functions of Education Scotland, whether that's its role as the inspectorate or the role in relation to educational development, are both focused on the improvement of the quality of Scottish education. Um, but I will, of course, consider any representations that are made to me through the consultation exercise, whether from the Royal Society of Edinburgh or from Mr Scott, uh, on this particular question. Question number two, Gil Patterson. Uh, many thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with the Attainment Scotland Fund. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, more than 300 primary schools across 21 local authority areas were supported in 2015-16 through the Scottish Attainment Fund. 
£11.7 million was allocated to seven challenge authorities with the greatest concentration of primary aged children living in the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland. And a further £2.5 million was allocated to 57 schools across 14 local authorities through the Attainment Scotland Fund Schools Programme. Following the election, we expanded the, attainment, the Scottish Attainment Fund to £750 million over the next five years. This has allowed us to double the funding for our existing challenge authorities and schools programme to £50 million per year, extending the reach of the challenge to include secondary schools and two additional challenge authorities. From financial year 2017-18, the additional £100 million per annum that will be raised each year from our council tax reforms will be allocated directly to schools, with head teachers given the freedom to invest the extra resources in the ways they consider will have the biggest impact on raising attainment in their schools. Gil Patterson. Uh, may, may I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? Can the Cabinet Secretary outline whether every school in Scotland will benefit from the attainment fund uh, within the lifetime of this Parliament, thereby allowing every child to directly benefit from this additional edu educational spend? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President, officer, the Scottish Attainment Challenge is about achieving equity in educational outcomes with a particular focus on closing the poverty related attainment gap. The uh, Supporting Attainment Scotland Fund is targeted at the significant number of children in Scotland whose educational outcomes are adversely affected by poverty. Therefore, funding has been directed at those schools and authorities with the highest levels of depriva deprivation. In 2017-18, that will be extended to all schools who have children who are eligible for free school meals, extending the reach much more widely across Scotland. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. And could I ask the Cabinet Secretary for some clarification on that last point about the free school meals? Because obviously in primaries one to three, all children are liable for a free school meal. Does he intend therefore to use the existing uh, measure or will there be some new adjustment to that? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'd make two points in response to Liz Smith. Um, clearly there's a, a, a well-established methodology for the calculation of entitlement to free school meals and that is one measure the government um, could use in this respect. And that is what the government set out in our manifesto we would do. Um, the second point I would make is that um, I have made it clear to interested parties that um, if there is viewed to be a more effective um, measurement that would target resources to address deprivation across Scotland, I'm prepared to consider that measure. But in the absence of any alternative, I think the eligibility for free school meals is the most robust and reliable mechanism we have available to us uh, to determine that eligibility. Question number three, Ivan McKee. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on making it mandatory to train teachers about inclusive education. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the standard for full registration managed by the General Teaching Council for Scotland requires all teachers to show in their day-to-day -day practice a commitment to social justice, inclusion and caring for and protecting children. The Scottish Government will work with the General Teaching Council for Scotland to provide more support to teachers on equality issues by August 2017. In addition, we will require all new guidance and promoted teachers and eventually all teachers to undertake training so that they are confident in tackling prejudice-based bullying in schools. We will also ensure that schools address the important issues that LGBTI young people face and that teachers have the skills, knowledge and confidence to embed inclusive approaches in their schools. Ivan McKee. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, that response. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Scottish Government's strategy in this area is to issue LGBT inclusive guidance to schools and local authorities, but there is currently no requirement for schools to deliver upon this. There is clear evidence from research conducted by the Thai campaign that this approach leads to a situation whereby some schools are LGBT inclusive and others are not. Can the Scottish Government advise as to whether there are plans to rectify this in order to ensure that all schools are delivering an LGBT inclusive education? Cabinet Secretary. So, so let me first of all agree wholeheartedly with the aspiration that um, Mr McKee set out in his quite the latter part of his question that it is vital that in every school in the country um, there is an ability and a capability to ensure that LGBTI issues are dealt with properly and effectively and that any young people who are in any way um, prejudiced um, uh, uh, in this respect uh, are supported and that uh, unacceptable practice is tackled. 
Um, we address this mainly through the guidance that is available through um, uh, that is made available to, to schools. Um, the principal area of this guidance is the relationship, sexual health and parenthood education materials that are made available to school. And the government, of course, is currently reviewing our national approach to anti-bullying for children's, uh, Scotland's children and young people. Um, we want to make sure that that guidance is relevant and current uh, for all schools within Scotland. And there is wide dialogue being undertaken with LGBTI groups to ensure that the work that is undertaken to review this guidance is effective and that creates the approach with which um, I wholeheartedly agree with Mr McKee has got to be the case in any school in our country. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, research also by the Thai campaign published earlier this month suggested that 90% of LGBT pupils had experienced homophobia and that 42% had attempted to commit suicide. Following on from the questions by Ivan McKee, when mandatory training and guidance can be issued to schools on identifying radicalisation in the classroom, why can't such a similar mechanism for identifying homophobia and bullying in the classroom also be rolled out? Cabinet Secretary. The uh, approach in this respect, as I've set out to Mr McKee, as I set out in answers to uh, a topical question a couple of weeks ago, um, is to ensure that schools are properly and fully equipped with the trained personnel and the guidance to ensure that these issues can be handled properly. Um, it is intolerable that young people should face bullying of any description in our schools and it is particularly um, intolerable that young people should um, uh, experience any homophobic bullying. And the guidance that the government issues, the approach that we take in relation to teacher training, is designed to ensure that that is the approach that is taken in all schools in the country. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the commitment to roll out training by August 17, but that's quite a long time away. And we know that only 55% of teachers are aware of the current guidance that is in place. Today, the Time for Inclusive Education campaign has a very simple ask. They're looking for our help. They're asking MSPs to sign the campaign pledge. It takes a couple of seconds to do so on Twitter. And I'm really pleased across the chamber a number of the MSPs have already done so. Can I ask the Scottish Government if members of the education front bench will be doing the same today? Because I think it would send a very important signal to the Thai campaign and to young people in the classroom. But I, I, I've put on the record my position in relation to um, LGBTI issues and uh, any existence of bullying. Um, I will look at the material that Monica Lynn has drawn to my attention today, uh, but let me re-emphasise uh, from the education front bench the government's absolute determination to ensure that we do everything we can to support um, young people who are in any way affected by prejudice-based bullying uh, and to ensure that we have the proper support in place in our schools to enable that to be the case. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his responses? When he's looking at the guidelines and schemes going forward, would he also look at uh, bullying for disabled people uh, within our schools? Um, there seems to be an underreporting of this particular bullying for the disabled community who are being mainstreamed. And I think there's a concern amongst many disabled groups that this is simply going unreported and teachers are not able at the moment to give the appropriate education for both obvious disability and also hidden disability. Cabinet Secretary. I think uh, the issues that I've covered already in my answer are as relevant in dealing with Mr Balfour's important question um, as they have been in relation to the issues um, for the LGBTI community. Um, I, I said in my, my first answer that um, the government um, is uh, intolerant of any bullying and we must make sure that schools are equipped to support young people who are in any way affected by that, whatever the circumstances or the excuse for the bullying that is put forward. Um, I, I think I, I've seen myself in different schools in the country uh, a tremendous empathy and support for young people with disabilities. I think there is, there is some, you know, I, I, I don't doubt the existence of concerns that Mr. Balfour has raised in Parliament today. I've also seen myself tremendous practice within our schools to support young people with disabilities and to ensure that they are effectively um, assisted in every way that we can do. But uh, I'll certainly make sure that the guidance that is brought forward is comprehensive, is effective, and it meets the needs of young people who are um, who are the victims of bullying, regardless of the excuse that is levelled for that bullying. Question number four, Gordon MacDonald. 
Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to help and support students from Scotland who want to study elsewhere in the UK, the EU. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. Thank you, President Officer. In 2014-15, we launched a pilot project to support Scottish domiciled undergraduates to attend a number of universities in other EU countries. Students taking part do not pay tuition fees and are entitled to apply for the same living cost support as those studying in Scotland. We also provide support for a small number of postgraduate students to study at selected European higher education institutions. The Scottish Government also continues to support the Erasmus Plus programme and the British Council's International Association for the Exchange of Students for Technical Experience programmes. Over the last four years, with much funding from universities, colleges and students' associations, the Scottish Government has invested over £500,000 through its Outward Mobility Fund to support 50 projects and over 600 student places of varying dura duration and type in Europe, Canada, China, USA and India. Gordon McGillan. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Scottish Government's portability pilot is due to run into the end of academic year 2016-17. Constituents who have contacted the Student Awards Agency Scotland have been informed that, and I quote, because of possible constraints as a result of the EU referendum result, we cannot at present state our funding position for any new students starting undergraduate degrees from 2017-2018. Given that Scottish domicile students studying at eligible European universities can apply for the same bursary and loan support as students Attend, attending university in Scotland, what steps will the government take to ensure that this very valuable link to Europe for future generations of young Scots will remain open? Minister. Well, as I said in my initial answer to Mr Macdonald, this is a pilot project and it is due to end with the 2016-17 intake of students and we will then evaluate it. Uh, I should be clear that all students currently taking part and those beginning an eligible course this year will be supported to complete their whole studies. Before con confirming the continuation of the pilot, it is important, however, that we do assess the overall impact of the programme and its success. As part of this, we will obviously look at the potential impact on Brexit of student mobility in Europe, um, but the member should be reassured that we will continue to um, want Scottish students to play their full part in the European Union, to study and to seek benefit from that, whatever that um, particular programme will be. So he can at least be assured that this government uh, will continue to want the Scottish students to play a full part within the European Union. Tavis Scott. Can I, uh, in pursuing that question, wonder, uh, encourage the, rather the um, Minister to address the issue of college students uh, who will be needed more in apprentice skills because uh, if Brexit happens in the way in which we believe it may happen, uh, then the number of apprentices we need, particularly in the construction industry, is going to become more so. And would you undertake to look into that with the respective colleges uh, so as to ensure that uh, the growth of apprentices continues to happen so as to meet these skills needs that are very clear in industry across Scotland now? Minister. Tavish Scott raises a, a very important point about the implications for Brexit and the requirements for uh, the economies and the construction sector is of course one of those parts. Apprenticeships um, have, been, have played a very important part in the, the Scottish Government's uh, commitment to its offerings for young people and we of course have made a commitment to increase the number of apprenticeships. Construction will play a very, very important that and I take the point that Tavish Scott um, has made today on board. Question number five, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it takes to ensure that there is equality in admissions to university places for people who meet the entrance requirements. Minister. As autonomous institutions, universities are ultimately responsible for their own admissions procedures and decisions. That said, we invest more than £51 million every year to support around 7,000 places targeted on disadvantaged learners and those progressing from college. We have also welcomed the final report of the Commission on Widening Access, which commented extensively on how admissions could be made fairer. We will continue to work closely with the university sector on how best to take forward the implementation of the Commission's recommendations. Willie Coffey. Thank the Minister for, for that answer. I understand there is little or no centralised data showing where the successful and in particular the unsuccessful applicants come from who actually meet the entrance requirements for courses like medicine law and dentistry. Is that something the government will seek to address as it takes forward the attainment agenda to ensure equality 
of access is achieved. Minister. Well, although data on entrance to university by socio-economic background is available, the Widening Access Commission recognised the need for enhanced data and analysis on access is required. My officials are therefore working with the Scottish Funding Council to deliver the Commission's recommendations for better monitoring of fair access at key stages of the learner journey, including applications, offers and acceptances to universities. So we are working closely with the sector and the Scottish Funding Council to progress the Commission's recommendations on admissions, and I hope that that will address Willie Coffey's concerns on this point. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the final report of the Commission for Widening Access was widely uh, welcomed across this chamber. So with that in mind, could the Minister confirm what steps have been taken to appoint a Commissioner for Fair Access and when we might expect a Commissioner to be imposed? Minister. <coughs> This was a, a very important uh, part of the Commission's recommendations and uh, the Government is, is very keen to, to make an appointment on that. It has to be the, the right appointment. We want somebody that can challenge not just the sector but the Government. So we are looking for someone that will independently scrutinise both ourselves and what's happening out with, um, within the wider university sector. We do hope to make an appointment on that soon but it's important that we can speak to a number of people and continue to do so until we're very sure that we have the right person to um, not only hold this government to account, but the rest of the sector as well. Question number six, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it's made of the implications of Brexit for the college sector. Minister. The Scottish Government is determined to protect our place in Europe and will explore all options to do so. The UK vote to leave the EU presents a period of uncertainty for our education sector, including our colleges. The Scottish Funding Council and other partner bodies, such as Skills Development Scotland, is working to establish the potential impact on the sector in terms of EU funding, EU students and EU staff. And we will also expect agencies to work with the college sector to explore opportunities to continue its relationship with Europe and to seek ways to mitigate the potential impacts at this time of great change. Graham Day. I thank the Minister for the answer. The Minister will be aware from a recent visit there of the success story that is Dundee and Angus College. However, the progress made post-regionalisation now faces being undermined by Brexit, with the College confronted by the loss of £2 million annually in ESF and ERDF funding as a consequence of the UK leaving the EU. Can I ask her if there are any specific steps the Scottish Government can take to try and protect the College sector from the ravages of Brexit? Minister. Well, as, as the member said, I, I did very much enjoy my visit to the college during the summer recess and saw firsthand what's going on within the college, both on employability and had a chance to speak to EU students while I was there. And of course, our ability to fully assess the different options will be constrained with regards to Brexit until we start to gain some clarity about what the UK government is actually seeking to achieve themselves. As I've mentioned to the member, the Scottish Funding Council will work with both colleges and universities to assess the impact, and I will continue to discuss these issues with colleges and, and universities to ensure that I'm fully appraised of the referendum result and how we can ensure Scotland's colleges and universities remain attractive and enhance their competitiveness in a global education market. Question number seven, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether the provision of physical education and extracurricular activity in schools is encouraging children to lead active and healthy lifestyles. Cabinet Secretary Johnson. Presiding Officer, quality physical education provides young people and children with the fundamental competencies and skills necessary for lifelong participation in sport and physical activity. 98% of primary and secondary pupils across Scotland are now providing, sorry, 98% of primary and secondary schools are now providing at least two hours or two periods of PE a week. This is a key part of our sport strategy for children and young people, giving children and young people a sporting chance in their future life. Brian Whittle. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Uh, the reality is that there is a decreasing uh, number of opportunities for all youngsters to participate and that school PE has a very limited time allocated to it and worryingly is being squeezed out of the curriculum more and more. Time allocated to PE is advisory rather than compulsory and in many cases the school gates are shut at 4pm and therefore access to facilities is cut off. Increasingly clubs now have waiting lists and we are turning away many who are eager to take part. Will the government look at opening up school facilities after school hours across the country to give children an accessible opportunity to get active? Cabinet Secretary. 
first thing I'd say to Mr Whittle is that I'm just a little bit perplexed by, um, frankly, the doom-laden character of his question. Uh, I said in my initial answer that 98% of primary and secondary schools across Scotland are providing at least two hours or two periods of PE a week. That is a significant improvement on what used to be the position in the country. The second point I would make is that Mr Whittle comes here and complains about the difficulties of school opening hours. Maybe his party has been a great advocate of PFI. PFI arrangements for schools have been one of the significant factors restricting the availability and opening of schools by nature of the restrictions of the contracts. And thirdly, um, I witness across the country a tremendous amount of voluntary energy and enthusiasm given to encourage our young people to be active and healthy. Um, nobody obliges the primary school that my son goes to to take part in the Daily Mile, but they do because of the enthusiasm and the energy of teaching staff. So I know Mr Whittle has a lot of interest and enthusiasm for encouraging children uh, to lead active and healthy lifestyles, and I share his aspiration, but I would encourage him to be slightly more positive in expressing the point of view. Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, in relation to the Daily Mile that my question refers to, can you give an update on the progress in rolling out uh, the Daily Mile, not just in primary schools and other schools, but also in preschool provision, and whether there could be a benefit in terms of addressing the attainment gap also by getting young people more physically active? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, the Government is committed in, uh, to Scotland becoming the first Daily Mile nation. Uh, since the Cabinet Secretaries for Education and Lifelong Learning and Health and Wellbeing wrote to all head teachers in Scotland in November 2015 to inform them of this, this initiative, at least 800 primary schools in Scotland, that's 41% of the total number, are now participating in the Daily Mile programme, adapting the basic idea to meet their own circumstances. So I would, I would highlight that point to Mr Doris and to other members, including to Mr Whittle, that in the space of periods since November 2015, 41% of primary schools in Scotland have adopted the Daily Mile or adapted it to their programme, which I think is a welcome indication of progress on physical activity in our schools. Question number eight, Ross Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government what the mechanism will be for distributing monies from the Attainment Scotland Fund to schools. Cabinet Secretary. So during the first two years of the Scottish Attainment Challenge, we used the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, which is a long-established set of indicators that shows levels of deprivation in communities across Scotland, to identify the authorities and schools with the greatest concentration of school-aged children living in the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland. This mechanism has been used to allocate funding through our existing challenge authorities and schools programme to more than 300 primary schools and 100 secondary schools across 21 local authorities. We secured a mandate at the recent election to raise an additional £100 million per year through our council tax reforms, specifically, specifically for raising educational attainment. Our manifesto proposed that this additional funding should be allocated directly to schools based on eligibility for free school meals from 2017-18. We are engaging with local government representatives in COSLA, the Association of Directors of Education and the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives on the key principles underpinning this additional £100 million, and these discussions will inform the approach to determining eligibility and distribution of the funds. Ross Thompson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Given that the money will be removed from council grants to spend nationally elsewhere, what percentage of this funding will be spent in the northeast of Scotland, and can the Cabinet Secretary guarantee that disadvantaged pupils in the region will not lose out? Cabinet Secretary. I'd say two things to uh, Mr Thompson. The first is that all council tax um, uh, income that is raised in all local authority areas will be retained in those local authority areas. And the second point I would say to Mr Thompson is that the mechanism that I set out in my answer, um, which is uh, the utilisation of the eligibility for free school meals, is designed to ensure, and that's a development from our existing position of using the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, um, the free school meals entitlement to eligibility is designed to ensure that we reach every young person who is living in poverty and to, to ensure that they receive um, the support to which they are entitled, regardless of the part of the country in which they live. Kate Forbes. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for that last answer. Can he provide reassurance to local authorities across Scotland that what they raise in council tax will stay in their local authority area? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I'm, I'm happy to give that confirmation that all council tax revenue that's raised in all local authority areas will be retained in those local authority areas. Um, that is the principle of local authority taxation and uh, that is what will continue after the reforms that we've undertaken. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary is uh, saying exactly the same thing as Derek Mackay said uh, last week. It's, uh, yes, it's, it, it's consistent, but it's slightly misleading. Um, it, is, it is accurate to say that councils will retain all the council tax they raise, but the money will be clawed back through a cut in grants. So the question really for Mr Swinney is, will the cut in grants in particular areas be more than is raised in council tax? Cabinet Secretary. I think, I, think, I think Mr Simpson rather gets the wrong end of the stick here. The £100 million is going to be new revenue that is raised. It's going to be raised and will be part of the council tax that is raised in every local authority area. And as is normal practice in all aspects of local government finance, which has been the case throughout time, or certainly for all the time I've ever had anything to do with local authority finance, that the level of revenue support grant for individual local authorities is a product of how much is raised in council tax and non-domestic rates in local authority areas into the bargain. So Mr Simpson should be reassured that all of the money raised in council tax in every local authority area will be retained in that local authority area. And I hope that allows him to sleep a bit easier in his bed tonight as a consequence of that absolute clarity. Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. The point is that COSLA are absolutely clear that what we're seeing is local finances being pulled back with £100 million taken back and then redistributed across Scotland. So it's a play with words, but the truth is that you are taking council tax monies off local authorities because you're taking £100 million off their grant and you're telling them they can make up that up by raising council tax. I think we have to have a degree of pulling together and, 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 and working together in terms of transparency around this. Cabinet Secretary. There's two, there's two, there's two very uh, distinct parts of the government's commitments on local authority taxation. The first is in relation to the rebanding of the council tax and the extension of the bans, of an order of which is currently being considered by Parliament. There is also the government's manifesto commitment to enable local authorities to raise um, the council tax by 3%, entirely separate from that process of the banding exercise. And Mr Mackay and I were just talking about this issue with COSLA at one of our regular meetings this morning in relation to these questions. So um, th th there are two separate processes underway here. And Mr Rowley should be, you know, Mr, Mr Rowley has been a member of a leader of a local authority in the past. He knows the way local authority finance is work. Uh, revenue support grant is a product of the, um, uh, the, the amount of revenue that is raised by local authorities in council tax and non-domestic rates, and revenue support grant is influenced by the factors uh, that are generated by the amount of revenue that is raised by those two uh, sources of local authority income. Question number nine, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what contribution improving support at school for young children with autism will make towards meeting its ambition to close the educational attainment gap. Cabinet Secretary. So, our ambition is to deliver equity and excellence for all children and young people, supporting them to reach their full potential, including those affected by autism. The Additional Support for Learning Act provides the legal framework for the identification of provision for and review of personalised support for children and young people who face barriers to learning, including those arising from autism. In order to help schools meet the needs of these pupils, the Scottish Government has supported the development of the Autism Toolbox, published in 2014. Uh, the Toolbox provides guidance on the planning and support of pupils and training of staff, as well as sharing examples of best practice. The Toolbox also provides a forum for continually updating and disseminating good practice. Bob Doris. Um, thank you, President Officer, and thank you for that answer, Cabinet Secretary. In recent months, I have had a number of families in my constituents raise concerns over the support available 
uh, for children, particularly as the transition from nursery school into primary one, where a presumption of mainstreaming applies, but not always backed up with the support required. I am concerned that a lack of support may impact on the educational attainment of some of our most vulnerable children. I suspect that is not isolated to Glasgow. As part of addressing the attainment gap, will the Cabinet Secretary review how local authorities provide such support for vulnerable children? Cabinet Secretary. I, think, I, I certainly believe that the framework that we have in place, and certainly the legislative framework that is in place from the Additional Support for Learning Act, um, should provide and address um, exactly the point that has been made by Mr Doris. Um, but I am obviously very happy to look at particular examples and experience that he's had to, to try to ensure this is the case because fundamentally uh, we have a, a, an obligation as a government and as a public sector to work to get it right for every child in Scotland that means about meeting the needs of young people um, whatever their circumstances and young people with autism will have particular support requirements and uh, all public authorities in which in, 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 the way, in the responsibilities that they exercise should take due account of that within the legislative framework of the Additional Support for Learning Act. But if Mr Doris would care to write to me about any further detail about this, I'd be happy to explore that on his behalf. Question 10, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government when it will provide an update on the progress of its education governance review. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I launched the governance review on the 13th of September and it will run until the 6th of January 2017. The governance review is an opportunity to engage in a positive debate. We want to hear from children and young people, from parents, teachers, practitioners and the wider community. We want to hear from those with a formal role in our education system and those who share a stake in its success. Um, I will, of course, update Parliament following the conclusion of the review uh, to set out the government's actions in relation to the consultation exercise. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that the statutory responsibility in these matters lies with education authorities and a number of those authorities in the north and northeast of Scotland are already working together uh, to address joint concerns in particular around the recruitment and retention of teachers. Will uh, the government in looking at these matters consider shifting the focus of its workforce planning from simply focusing on the national picture to focusing on the individual needs of individual uh, education authorities in meeting their objectives in the recruitment and retention of teaching staff? Well, I think Mr Macdonald raises a very significant point and the, um, the experience of what has emerged as the Northern Alliance of Authorities in the area of the country that uh, when part of the area that Mr Macdonald represents um, and into Highland and the island communities is um, a welcome example of local authorities collaborating together to find solutions to common problems and teacher recruitment is one of those issues uh, but there are others uh, and, and also I might add um, ways of enhancing educational provision as a consequence of collaboration between local authorities. Now, that, that, that type of working is very much what is in my mind in relation to the issues I raised in the consultation exercise around um, uh, the regional education boards and the collaborations that we have talked about in that respect. Now, that, of course, enables solutions to be developed which might meet, for example, the teacher recruitment challenges that we face in the north of Scotland. So I think Mr Macdonald raises a, a very thoughtful point in relation to the consultation exercise, which I look forward to hearing more from him about and from the other authorities that he represents. Question 11, Richard Leonard. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent assessment it has made of the condition of college buildings. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. It is the responsibility of the Scottish Funding Council to advise ministers on the condition of college buildings. The SFF, SFC undertook an assessment of college estates in 2014 and refreshed that exercise earlier this year. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the Minister uh, for that answer? Um, uh, Audit Scotland uh, reported that Scotland's colleges face major funding challenges in financing capital improvements to their estate. The Scottish Funding Council study, uh, which the Minister referred to, looked at a third of the college sector and estimated that it, that it would cost £256 million, uh, that's over a quarter of a billion pounds, to bring those properties alone up to a decent standard. And yet, and yet, over the last four years, the Scottish Government has reduced its capital funding to colleges by over 70%, a drop from £90 million to £26.6 million. Does the Minister agree that the staff and students of Scotland's colleges need decent buildings to teach and learn in, so will she reverse these capital cuts? Minister. 
Well, the capital funding to the Scottish Government as a whole um, has fallen quite dramatically given the Westminster austerity measures. And I think there is a dose of realism that needs to be brought to the Chamber every single time an opposition member continues to make capital and revenue claims against this Government, then they at least have to bring a bit of reality to that as well. Now, we've invested £550 million in the College of States between 2007 and 2015, and we've continued to support the further education sector by supporting an investment for over £300 million worth in the MPD pipeline. He will, of course, have also noticed that in the programme for government announcement, colleges were awarded an additional £10 million of accelerated capital funding to help improve existing states, and I would expect the member to welcome that progress. Can I thank Minister and Members? That takes us to the end of topical questions. We move on to the next item of business.